Konnichiwa. Genki desu ka. Hello, how you doing? My name is Draft, and we're back with the second of the Inside the Project series, this time with a track called Bishop Takes King. A quick thank you to all those who checked out the first one, uh, Arara, which was out on We Are Friends Volume 5. This time we're going to have a bit more of an in-depth look uh, into basically all of Bishop Takes King, the project file, uh, how it was created, why it was created. And I'm not going to put on a posh accent anymore, so if you don't understand me, I'm sure you can activate subtitles somehow. Let's go. So this is the project file for Bishop Takes King. Everything pretty much happens within the playlist itself. Not too many tracks used, although it sounds like there's a lot going on. 45, I believe, 45 or so channels used. Again, not too many. Um, it sounds a lot more complex than it actually is. Um, there's a fair bit of automation that happens and occurs throughout the tune, but really it relies on its um, it's minimalist approach to, to achieve that big sound that I hope I nailed. We'll go through the drums, we'll go through the percussion, some effects, uh, and we'll also go through the melody, uh, how it was composed, why. Um, it's also worth pointing out at this moment, um, just over 20 hours worth of work went into it, um, but the timing is 3-4 which was something different that I wanted to try. Um, and I think it kind of complemented really, really well the sound I was trying to achieve and, and where I was trying to take the listener themselves. So the first thing you hear in the track is um, a reversed glass hit swirl kind of thing that features a bit of automation. So the sound itself is simply a one shot of a glass note. I believe someone's swirling their finger on a glass, I think. It's been looped, it's pitched down, and there's been some effects applied to it to give it a more subdued, uh, subtle effect. So without the effects, this is how it sounds. Very hard to decipher. So the first uh, effect I threw on it was uh, the Valhalla Room. Uh, I did actually go for a preset because I like the way it sounds, I'm not going to lie. Uh, some EQ, which strips out the highs, uh, the lows, although there are no real lows in it whatsoever, it's just habit. A second EQ, which again strips out low in that isn't really prominent, but the curvature on the low mids kind of strips away from, from that area, which helps. Uh, there's some multi-band compression that gives it a bit of drive, and there's a final EQ which strips out the high end and some of the mids to really set it back in the mix a lot more. And with those effects, this is how it sounds. And now all together when introducing the pad that sits underneath. Now when I pull it back in the mix, introducing the pad and the main melody, you can hear the subtle effect it has, just sort of buried underneath. Now again, later in the track with the pitch automation, you can hear how it fluctuates and gives an eerie kind of vibe um, as that transitional section starts to occur. So the first drawing point of Bishop Takes King is probably the melody, which runs throughout the track and is combined of uh, two separate uh, instances. Uh, processed heavily uh, and aided by the use of reverb, but it pretty much starts the track 
continues throughout, obviously to keep things interesting. And for overall added effect, there's some transitions aided by reverb. Uh, here's the glass on its own. And the instance of Massive on its own. So you can hear how that reverb gives it that washy uh, atmospheric effect and leads into uh, melody changes essentially and arrangement changes. So the first part of the tone is a, a water bowl hit thing. And the second is a uh, piece of sound design done within Massive, almost like a chime or a bell. Nothing too complex, there's a delay effect on it that, that kind of helps carry each note into the next, which I really, really liked. So the reverb was implemented to try and help create uh, a sense of imagery in the track for the listener. Um, and the easiest way to do that was to set up a reverb of how I wanted the end sound to be and then simply automate uh, the knob via uh, an envelope that I could easily drift in and out of throughout the track. And obviously as we approach certain areas that were leading into a, a new breakdown or a new transitional period or, or arrangement change, I would utilize the envelope, uh, bringing the reverb in a lot more and then pulling it back out to try and push that kind of dreamlike imagery into the listener's uh, face almost. So now there's also some additional uh, melodies that feature in the track. Uh, in particular towards the breakdown section, as it were. Uh, there's instances of Massive, uh, I've utilised the Prophet, and they've all been created and combined to try and attribute each other in essentially what uh, they were trying to achieve sonically. So I've bust together all of them, uh, which we'll go into, obviously, in separate instances as we go along. But the first uh, section is a massive and a profit. There is some processing that's gone into both of them in order to try and shape them, sculpt them a bit more. But the main principle was the camel fat, which again was the filter. So the camel fat filter was used obviously to create uh, crescendos as it were and builds and put emphasis on the melody and also take it away from the melody. So for example when the melody switches up, the easiest way to emphasise that, not only via the notes, was to have the filter uh, tone it down almost. And the filter also helps amplify arguably my favourite part of the track uh, and helps that transition. Now, there was also another instance of Massive which I've utilised, uh, just a kind of plucky noise that has the exact same melody as the Prophet uh, and the other instance of Massive except it's uh, an octave up and it really feels kind of the upper mids to the high end to kind of help cut through the mix slightly and add a bit of a, another dimension to the, to the sound itself. Again, I've used the cutoff filter on it and I've utilised it on different VSTs rather than on one straight bus, simply because it gives me a bit more control of, of how each synth and sound interacts with each other. <laughs> 
And as you can hear, it kind of just fills the upper area a bit more and has a nice undercurrent to it just to help the flow of the melody as it goes. Now there's also another instance of Massive, which is the Automation Chord Stab, which um, is just a weird kind of bulky, kind of square type sound that really just adds a bit more timber and a bit more weight to the melody itself. Um, it's got a bit of reverb on it, so it's not too prominent as it were. It's, it's fairly restrained in its delivery. But when laid back in with the other synths, it gives it that tiny bit more bulk that the original melody sort of lacked without it. Now, there's also a channel labeled Silent, which is not actually used, so we'll ignore that. So the main synth bus has some processing on it. Uh, the lows and the mids are boosted. There's some low mids that's been sort of pulled back a fair bit. There's a glue compressor, which basically glues them all together, makes them sound a bit more coherent and nice. Um, there's a bit more of a boost on the low mids again. Um, but if I pull it back, it kind of loses its dynamics. So I've just boosted slightly there. And the final uh, effect on the chain is a vintage verb with a slightly below 50% decay, which just kind of broadens and expands the sound out as it progresses. And then finally is a little bit of padding with an additional massive synth, which is kind of a super sore thing that just feels the very upper harmonics. Now onto the subs and the pads, the low pads. Um, there's some automation on a peak controller, which I'll introduce later, um, but it's just an undercurrent for the melody. Uh, there's no real variation that happens on the notes throughout the tune. They're just there to give a sort of undertone, almost, almost a sinister undertone as they flow throughout the track. So the peak controller is relatively basic in, in what it does. It's just set to automate the knob again. So I can control the tension as and when I want the volume to dip in and out. So there's the instance of Massive, which is a pad. Fairly simple, but it's just been low passed. And an instance of 3 times OSC, which is um, sporadic in its um, arrangement, but it just adds a little bit of weight uh, and low-end depth to the pad as and when needed. Now there's also separate sub-channels for a sine wave and a low pass square, which uh, has some pitch envelopes on it, very subtle and very slight. And there's also some arrangement on the sub uh, when the breakdown melodies come into play. And we have that whole section where the sub becomes a lot more prominent and almost driving to help push home um, that section of the track and really drive it through. So the sub is made up of a, a sine wave and a low pass square. 
Now the low pass square has some saturation on it. Uh, and is obviously low passed via the Pro-Q. And that sits just above the sine wave to add a bit of uh, continuity in, in its audible sound to the listener, essentially. Now there's also some very, very slight pitch adjustments um, that just kind of add to the overall feel of the track. They're not too audibly noticeable, but they're there. So when combined and the pad is introduced via the automation of the peak controller, it kind of gives you a, an eerie sense, an eerie feeling when the, the bells melody is occurring. And it just sifts in and out of the tune um, where the arrangement kind of required it more than anything. And when the arrangement needed it, the pads would drift out and add the emphasis back onto the main melody. And the sign and square combined really help drive uh, the melody change when it shifts in the breakdown. The square helps really push the low end through and really drives home the melody. Now this wonderful groaning drone. I've had people ask me if it's a dinosaur, if it was a sound of Godzilla, if it was me moaning, nothing like that. It was just an effect I wanted to add uh, in order to create a bit more space around the melody. Uh, the first note fits in time with the main melody. And then when the, the key changes uh, towards the middle of the structure, uh, the notes just push down one. Now the original sound sounds like this. And without the effects, Now with the parameter, first parametric EQ, I boosted the lows, pulled out the, the mids and low mids a bit. I've added a multiband compressor to give it a bit more drive and a bit more oomph. The Valhalla Room, um, again, I think I used a preset on this because I just like the way it held. And the final instance of a parametric EQ, I strip out some low end, pull back on the lower mids, and just drive on the upper mids a bit more to give it a bit more uh, treble, a bit more prominence uh, in the mix, essentially. And again, when the notes change, it just shifts down one note. I felt it really helped aid transitions and movements within the track just to add that extra dimension to it and again it was a sound that I found interesting uh, so I kind of hoped everyone else would too now the drums in this tune uh, are relatively basic and simple uh, which is kind of all they needed to be. It's two separate kicks laid together and a third which has a touch of reverb on. Um, I'm just gonna move it a bit closer for ease of use. So here's the kicks. The first kick and the second. <laughs> 
You'll notice I've stripped out the attack transient of the laid kick. And the reverbed kick is a vengeance drum. Um, which was utilized during the breakdown sections. Almost like a heartbeat, essentially. And it's used sporadically throughout the track further. Now the first kick drum, which is kind of the driver of the two, The second has had its lows stripped out and the highs slightly boosted um, and a bit of the mid stripped away. Just to give a bit more of a layer to sit on top of the main kick. Now on the bus there's a Pro C which I'm not usually a huge fan of compressing kicks but whatever. Um, where I've boosted the output to give it that little bit more of a drive. Parametric EQ2 on the high end to really help it cut through the mix a bit more. There's a slight bit more compression on it just to hold it all together. Uh, and then finally a Pro Q um, to pull out the low end to make it a bit more tidier. And then finally I've added a camel fat at the end with nothing else on it apart from the volume pull back on the master section which helps me contain and act, almost acts as a limiter, which I love Camel Fat for. Now the kick bus is also routed to uh, a dry and a wet channel for uh, a form of parallel compression. Um, we'll get there just after the snares anyway. But the snare drums, uh, two simple snares, one is what I call the mutant snare, it's just built up of tin cans and granulized acoustic snares, and the second is the trademark grime Wiley snare, which I had to use at some point so I thought I'd throw it in this one. Uh, there's some EQ work on it, just to roll off on the low end. Keep it tidy a bit. They're also bust together. Um, there's an EQ which rolls off the low end, uh, pushes a bit of the mid slightly, and the upper mids to help it cut through the mix a bit more. There's also a Pro C, which isn't actually doing much apart from pushing the dry signal a bit more. Give it a bit more volume. There's another EQ where I've just boosted the upper regions. There's a very, very faint Valhalla Room uh, instance on it. And finally, the Camel Fat, where I've left the volume at zero to act as a limit so it won't peak above the 6 dB. The snare bus is also rooted to the dry and wet, uh, along with the, the kicks themselves. The wet solo and the dry solo, and together. Now on the dry channel we have a compressor, OTT and camel fat, all set to default values. Uh, the OTT's depth is set to zero obviously. On the wet channel, we have some hard compression. An instance of OTT, which I haven't actually uh, affected too much in terms of the upwards compression. And the other instance of camel fat to act as that, that barrier, essentially. And when combined together, it gives it a bit more punch, a bit more grit, which kind of really helps them pierce through the mix. 
And for the structure itself, there was no weird rhythmic patterns. It was a fairly rigid uh, and structured drum beat. Uh, there's some additional percussion, which we'll go over later. Um, but it was just big bashy drums that really helped carry the tune. Percussion. Now there's a number of channels that are effective here. Might look complicated, certainly not. Run throughout the tune, obviously with variations in and when they dip in and out. Here's how it sounds together, isolated from the mix. We have essentially a hi-hat. We have a shifted pitched kind of shake scrape thing. We have a shaker. A cowbell, which I threatened to use, and I did. There's also a low percussive drum hit, which when combined with the shakes in the hat, helped fill up the spectrum a bit more. There's also an additional percussion uh, set up. Uh, it's kind of panned everywhere. Very subtle in its delivery. Wasn't meant to do much other than add a bit of a, another dimension, a kind of an additional percussion. And now all together with the rest of the tune. Hopefully they become a bit more obvious now. So the hat is just a standard acoustic hi-hat. It hits with the kick, uh, helps it cut through the mix that little bit more. The scrape shaker and shaker things give it a bit more of a shuffle flow. And then the cowbell just sort of rounds it off. So now you'll hear how the additional percussion, the subdued percussion, uh, works with the kick drum. If I strip out the melodies. The additional subdued percussion um, was kind of a groove assisting tool that was one of the first elements I created when starting the track. Uh, they just kind of stayed there throughout. And the more I worked, within the tune and built it up, the more effective they became sounding without me even meaning to. So I, I stuck with them. Now there's some processing on the bus itself. Um, there's a couple of parametric EQs and a compressor, which is actually set quite harsh uh, in a bid to try and draw out the attack transients a bit more. Now when it comes to the hats, there's some EQ and compression. Um, routinely I would set them to mono for the sake of the mix, but in this instance, I liked the stereo width that they provided. Um, I opted to not pan it. The pitch shaker just has a bit of EQ. Sounds quite flat without. The shaker has some EQ on the high end uh, and a transient shaper to kind of strip off the release. And the cowbell I threatened to use, uh, without the reverb and EQ, sounds pretty flat. So I threw on some reverb uh, and an EQ, which strips out the low end, uh, boosts around the attack transient, uh, and some high end to help sort of shape it in the mix a bit more. Now with this isolated percussive audio, uh, start back in the mix. Hopefully you can hear how they add a bit more of a, a compliment, a bit more of a harmony uh, to the kick and snare combo as well as the tune itself. <laughs> 
Now, if I bring each element back in one at a time, you'll hopefully hear the effect and how it helps pad out um, the overall percussive uh, element to the track. And then to help end the track, uh, I used the subtle groove assisting rhythm percussion thing uh, just to help kind of draw the track to a close uh, as it rolled with the melody. Lastly, the effects. Um, only three instances of effects in the whole tune, essentially. Um, the first is a riser, straight from a vengeance pack, no shame. And there's only a slight bit of processing that went into that. There's an EQ which strips out the uh, upper mids and the high end essentially. Um, there's a Valhalla room where I've kept the bass multiplier in uh, for no actual real reason. Uh, and there's another instance of the EQ where I just pull back uh, the mids a touch more and strip out the high end, or the very high end should I say, um, just, to help, just to help the riser sit behind the melody uh, a bit more in the mix. Fairly simple stuff. The next effect is straight out of my own warped sound design folder. I can't actually remember how I did it, where I did it, which doesn't really help, but here's the original sound. It's been pitched down. Initially it sounded like this. For emphasis in this, I've pitched it down. Uh, I've added an EQ, which strips out the dirty low end. There's a vintage verb with a fair amount of decay on it. Uh, there's a parametric EQ, which again, just tidies it up a bit more. An instance of Valhalla Room, which gives it a bit more of a prolonged release in the mix. And then uh, an Uber mod, which um, is very subtle in its kind of delayed shuffle, as it were. Then one of my favorite effects is impending doom, I called it. Straight out of CSATV. All comes from one sample. Here's the first. Uh, if I take the processing off, very odd and peculiar, and I really, really like the way that it's shuffled across the, uh, the spectrum analyzer there. Nice. So the process behind it is an EQ where I've pulled back some offending frequencies in my eyes, in my ears. There's also a flanger, flanger, whatever on it. Uh, again, another parametric EQ where I've just pulled a bit more of the mids out. Uh, another EQ where I've continued to pull out the mids and just some of the upper mids as well. There's a vintage verb with a bit of decay. Um, the mix isn't completely wet because I wanted to keep a bit restraint on, on, on how much flow went through the wet signal. And finally a compressor just to bring out all the levels against each other with the reverb and the effects of the, of the EQs and whatnot. The sample actually comes from multiple bounces. Um, I believe it's this one that I actually used. Uh, for the second section of it. <laughs> 
and this part is not too dissimilar. It's just a bit more distant, a bit more uh, almost spatial. And I found it just added an extra layer, an extra notch on top of the tune as a, a progression from the first one. So when the first instance is used, it's quite prominent, but as the melody kind of progresses, I wanted it to be a bit more restrained. So the second one kind of delivers on that. And in regards to the volume on the riser, uh, I didn't want it too prominent. I didn't want it too obvious. So I opted to have it fairly low in its volume. Just have it subliminally sit in the background uh, just to help with the transitions and whatever else. So that's pretty much Bishop Takes King. Long old video. Thank you for watching. Big up Mousetrap. <laughs>